Philippians chapter number 4, verse 8 and 9, as we continue in our series on how we ought to think. Tonight, the title of the message is, Think on What is Exactly Right. I've said it this way, don't succumb to a slight, think on what is exactly right. Don't succumb to a slight, think on what is exactly right. Look at verse 8 of Philippians chapter 4, where the Bible says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are, and here's the word tonight, just. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue... And if there be any praise, think on these things, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Lord, I thank you for the time we had tonight, Lord, for this church family and the wonderful folks who are helping right now in the services, Lord, the music and the, and the tack and the video, the sound. Lord, thank you for all that you're doing. Lord, thank you for those who are touched by the gospel on Sunday and, and the ones we've heard about Lord, others who have called in for a free book, Lord, thank you for all the contact that you did, Lord. Lord, I pray you give us wisdom now as we navigate the, fall, the coming weeks, Lord, to give, us, uh, give me the direction to know what decisions to make. And Lord, help us that we can soon come back together again. But Lord, give us grace and strength tonight as we look at your word. Lord, help us in our minds, this, this battlefield of our minds, that we'd have the victory. And as we look at this concept tonight, Lord, would you illuminate it to us through your spirit? Would you touch us where we've not been battling like we ought to? In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Well, tonight I want to look at this word, think on things that are just. We've looked at true, we've looked at honest, and tonight is, is just. I've given you some, some phrases already. Don't construe, think on what is true, and don't waste the space. Are my thoughts worthy? And tonight, the, the thought, don't succumb to a slight, or you can say it this way, before you react, your thoughts should be exact. I want to look at this word just tonight in the context of this verse, what it does for us, what it says to us. Like I mentioned even last week, each of these words overlaps the other concepts and the first one, true, kind of encompasses everything, but they bring a different nuance to the conversation, a different nuance, a different facet to our battlefield of our minds. I mentioned last week that I was going to change the illustration and instead of whack a mole, it's whack a thought. Now, I don't think you can see it yet, so we're going to have to switch camera views and angles here, but I have brought something with me tonight besides my sledgehammer. I have brought some things to smash. Last week I was so lonesome up here, I couldn't smash anything. I'm not allowed to smash, you know, like the organ, because Mr. Clark would just, you know, not be happy if I smashed the organ. So I brought some things to smash tonight, and I brought, first of all, or I was given, or they brought for me a can of Pringles. That will represent error. And in the battle of our minds, we must, with God's help, smash Whack a thought, those, those thoughts. We can give no place for those things. All right. Now, I'm a little nervous. I should actually call someone up here to smash it because, like, I'm not really good with a sledgehammer and I'm probably going to miss the Pringle can and probably hit myself in the foot. But that just make a tremendous sermon illustration forever and ever and ever. I know that I would never, ever live down smashing myself with a sledgehammer. I can see the memes now. All right. And for all of you who think you're funny about a televangelist, None of you were the first. I have gotten the same meme about now I preach a, a televangelist like 3,000 times. But I laugh at all of them. But the Bible tells us that, that we're supposed to think on not these things, but the things that are true. And so we're supposed to take this sledgehammer, can I give it a whirl? We're supposed to smash it. Oh, not bad. I'm going to try to smash it. Maybe I can hit it out. See, the, the nice thing is about this, when you have a staff, I've already asked Pastor Ryan to clean it up. So now it's just a matter of if I can smash it. All right, sma oh yeah, there we go. Smash that thing. But then I'm supposed to smash not only things that are an error, but things that are unworthy. As we looked at last week, things that have no place in a Christian. This is a birthday cake. My son James says, no, please don't do it. It has the plastic wrapping on there. Now, I don't know what's going to happen. I, they asked if I wanted the, the plastic case off it, and I said no. I figured it'd make a bigger mess if I said no. It's probably gone all over my pants, but you know what? You only live once. Supposed to take this sledgehammer then, all right, with God's word, 
and smash those things that are not worthy. Oh, that was disappointing. Thank you. And I got one more tonight. I got a watermelon. This one's going to be fun. We're going to come back to this. I will not forget tonight. I'm having too much fun. We'll look at this passage if we could. What is just? What, is, what does this word just mean to us? What is Paul trying to teach us? What is the Holy Spirit trying to touch us about? This word just is in the context or giving the idea of having thoughts that are correct, that are accurate in regards to other people. This word just has the idea of regards to others or a relational idea. Thoughts that would be exactly right in regards to friends, family, Christians. Things that would be right between a man to a man, interaction that way, or between a lady and another lady, or between a Christian to another Christian, or between a son to a dad, or, or to a mother and a daughter. I can't allow thoughts, I'm not supposed to allow thoughts in my head, that are not accurate in regards to my fellow humans and my fellow Christians. We know that these other thoughts, the incorrect thoughts in regards to human relationships and relationships between us and God can easily sneak in. Uh, one, one way to maybe think about it is this way. In Goldilocks and the Three Bears, right? Goldilocks went to the house and she, first of all, you know, I was, first of all, she, I think she, she sat in the chair. Did she leave in the bed? I don't know. She wanted something first. Chair. Chair first. We're telling me chair first. I don't know. I do know in each place, chair, bed, and porridge, it was too hot, too hard. Then it was too cold, too soft. Or it was just right. Exactly right. Give us a little different look at this word just. The Bible uses this word in Matthew chapter 1 verse 19. It talks about Joseph. Joseph, her husband, being a, the Bible says, just man. It's that same word, given the idea that he was honorable in his dealings with people. He was a just man. And because of that, the verse was on to explain that and not willing to make her a public example. Because he was just, because he had good dealings with people of honor and righteousness, that he was described as that being just. In, in Mark chapter 6, the Bible says, For Herod the king feared John, John the Baptist, knowing that he was a just man, and it holy, and observed him, and when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. John the Baptist is also called a, a man of integrity in his dealings with other people. He was just in the Old Testament, we'll use this word in that context of a just weight, a just balance. Something that is exactly what it's supposed to be, exactly right. But this word just in the New Testament always deals with interactions with other people. And so while the word truth deals with, I think exclusively in this whole verse, or the, the word truth deals like an umbrella for all of it, we have the word honest and honorable kind of linked together, and the word just dealing with the way I'm supposed to think toward people, I'm supposed to think exactly right. You ever been angry at somebody? Come on, yeah. You ever been angry at somebody and they never even knew it? Right? You're, you're irritated, upset, and, and uh, come on, you, you gave them good clues. I cited them when they walked past me. <clears throat> they should have known. Ever been upset with a spouse? Never, never. What's wrong, honey? Nothing. Really? Okay, well, I think I'll just go drink a Diet Coke then. <laughs> Said the most foolish man who ever lived, right? Anger at somebody who never even knew it, or, or upset with somebody, irritated somebody, and, and they had no clue, no clue that your spirit, that your thoughts were over in left field. They were not just. Thoughts. They were not exactly right. 
See, the Bible wants us to think on things that are right, that are correct, and in regards to other people. So I want to give us maybe a couple thoughts about this as we look at this idea of, uh, of justness in our thoughts and how it affects us. I would, first of all, submit that sometimes all right, these thoughts happen in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Yes. In circumstances. Something will happen and we will get mad at God. These thoughts are not accurate thoughts in regards to our relationship with our Heavenly Father. We get mad at Him. We, we get mad at Him for allowing sometimes what we consider to be bad circumstances in our lives. All right, we've been angry at, at what, life, what life has dealt us. I don't deserve to have a flat tire. Why? Because I'm a Christian. You know, Lord knows I read my Bible all day, so I shouldn't have any flat tires. Because the Bible says, if you love God and keep His commandments, you'll never have a flat tire. Right? I don't deserve to have any hardship in my finances because, you know, I love God and I've tried to serve Him faithfully. So there's no reason to have any hardship in my finances. And we don't have just thoughts all right, in our relationship toward, toward our God. Years back now, if the ashes were are on, all right, I will, I will confess bitterness, not, not toward them. But when I'm driving to the ashes wedding, I was driving in one, a, a new car for me. It was a Lincoln Town car. Boy, I love that car. I bought it from Pastor Lett, who bought it from Aaron Bays, who bought it from Irvy Hewitt. Is that Mike, right on that? Pretty, pretty close. Not exactly right, but okay. All right. Anyway, it was, so it was my car like six times removed, all right? You know, 12 times removed. But I loved that car. My wife loved it. It had heated seats. It rode on that nice air right Lincoln Town car, and it, it, had a, it had a V8 in it. It had a great passing gear. I'd be going 75 miles an hour and want to go 76 miles an hour, and it'd get there pretty quick, right? Um, in Ohio, I think it was, or on the way to, the, to, to Marie and Andy's wedding, and uh, Marie's from Ohio, and I don't know if I was all the way there yet, but I was on the way, and I was at an exit. There's a semi-truck, and he was in the middle or the left turn lane. I went in the right-hand turn lane. He ended up turning right and hitting my Lincoln Town car. Thank you. People here are awing of you. Home, please awe. This is a general truth. You should not hit someone else's car, okay, just generally speaking. All right, you shouldn't steal one either, just on the side note. But the, my Lincoln Town car got hit right in the rear quarter panel behind the driver's door. So it was back here. He turned into me, all right, and, and hit me. Well, those tent town cars are built like a tank, all right? The door, I don't think the door would open, if I remember correctly. It was all, it was all smashed. You know, I got hit by a semi-truck, okay? It wasn't, like a, it wasn't like a mosquito. But it still ran all the way to Ohio to the wedding and back home again just fine, all right? Just can't maybe get in the back seat over here. Well, I was a little bit frustrated about, about getting a car smashed. I just, you know, it's not something I enjoy. I just got, the, you know, recently got the car. It was enjoyable to ride in one of probably the nicest car I had ever owned at that point. Man, and just enjoyed it. And here's my car smashed. Got back home and got with the insurance company. And I took it out to what was then um, All-American Ford, now Wilson Ford, where the Robertson works. And that body shop just did a, just did a beautiful job on that car. They did, I want to say it was about $8,300 worth of, of work to the back of that car. And it was about, uh, all, not quite double, about one and uh, one and three quarters more than I paid for the car. All right? They did that. And just in the rear quarter panel. And it looked, I mean, they did a beautiful job. This car looked really nice. Finally, I got it back. And I don't know how it is. I mean, I try to, try to keep my things nice and take care of them. So when something smashed, it, you know, it was, finally got it all fixed up again and felt good again and and, you know, I liked that car, enjoyed it. My wife loved the heated seats. I, I don't think it was the same day, but it seems like the same day. It was a Wednesday night. I'm driving home from church. I had just gotten the car back within just a few days, if not the same day, but I'm sure it was a different day. I'm driving home from church, from church, worshiping the Lord. All right, serving God. It wasn't out at, at the bar or Liquor King or, or whatever. I'm at church, for heaven's sake. I'm driving home. And I'm almost to the, to the tracks on King Road, heading toward my house on Airport Road, when a deer jumps out and hits my car. Now you say, Pastor, you hit the deer. I did not hit the deer. Now I'll prove it to you. He jumped into the exact same quarter panel. If I had hit it, I would have hit it with the front of my car, but he hit the rear of my car. Right. Smashed it. 
I, I saw him, I slammed my brakes, and boom! Heard that crunch. You've heard it if you've been hit, or you know, you've heard it before. I ripped my car over to the side of the road. And right then, I was hot. <laughs> I was not happy. I was not walking in the spirit. Okay, I was fulfilling the lust of the flesh. I jumped out, I slammed my door. I slammed it, and I went looking for that deer. <laughs> I was going to kick it. I said, if it's not dead yet, it will be when I get done with it. And I, all those thoughts that come into our mind, those unjust thoughts. Those all the, I mean, I can't remember all of them, but you can imagine where our minds go. And maybe yours has maybe done this before in your life. Uh, you know, of all the nerve, I'm coming home from church. God could let the deer here, here. I just got the car back. $8,500 deductible. Blah, 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 blah. You know what I got done? Couldn't find the deer, by the way. I looked. Probably a good thing. <laughs> Probably a good thing. I didn't feel any better. I, I didn't feel like, wow, you know what? Now that I flushed that out, I feel great now. This would be great. But I didn't obey Philippians chapter number four. I didn't, I didn't allow the, the right thoughts toward God and toward the circumstances to dominate my thinking. I allowed my own thoughts, God, this isn't fair. Like somehow God owes it to be fair to me and fair looks like I never have anything bad happen to me, right? Because that's my fairness. You know, that's not fair. Why can't it smash someone else's car? Well, I mean, look at the benefits. They already knew where to buy the parts for my car. They just bought the same parts all over again. And sure enough, I took it back to old American Ford, now Wilson Ford, but well, Scott Robertson works and they fix it again and it looked just as good as the very first time it got, before it got smashed the first time. Maybe you've been there before though, where circumstances come and those thoughts that are not just thoughts, that are not right, exactly right, toward my God. God, I don't deserve this. I've been trying to have my devotions with you, so obviously you're angry at me. That's why something bad happened. That's not a just thought. God, if you really loved me, if you really cared about me, then you would take care of this bill right now. That's not a just thought because I know my God loves me because my Bible tells me I can look at it every single day and my Bible is true from cover to cover. This blessed old book that I hold in my hand. Those thoughts come into our minds. And if we don't whack a thought, if we don't take that sledgehammer of God's word and think on these things, then our minds become overrun. Become overrun by thoughts that are not right toward our God. God, why, why did I have to lose my job right now when this person who doesn't love you as much as I do, why do they still get to go to work? Not a just thought. And I'm sorry for everyone who has been laid off right now. I pray for you. Right? I, I, I hope that, that God will alleviate your particular problems. But that doesn't give me an excuse or any of us an excuse to allow thoughts to be in our minds that are not right toward our God, not just thoughts. We have to make sure that our thoughts are right toward our God. Amen. Sometimes it's animosity and anger toward others. Thoughts that are blemished by anger that have no place in a Christian's life, in a child of God's mind. Love thinketh no evil, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. You see, this verse, this word has the idea that I should not allow thoughts that are of bad nature toward others. I want thoughts that are just right. I was a young youth pastor here at First Baptist Church. Not so young any longer, so they tell me. Young youth pastor had a youth activity. I don't remember what happened, but something happened on the youth activity. I look back now and I think, praise the Lord, he preserved us. Terrible things could have happened and God's gracious to, to me. Something happened and, and two parents who are no longer in, 
in this church, or kids are not here, so it was a long, long, long time ago. Came in, they were unhappy. They were unhappy with me. Not the first time, and I'm sure won't be the last time. I don't try to tick people off, but sometimes I do a good job at it. I don't need any text about that tonight, okay? It's just <laughs> They're in my office. I still remember them sitting there. And they said, that's it, Pastor J.D. So they called me as youth pastor. We're going to sue you. That time I had my red grand dam. About the only thing I owned at that time. <laughs> I said, we're going to sue you. Not the church, we're suing you. Now, I don't know what happened, but it obviously was a really, really bad thing. They wanted to sue me. I said, well, I said, you can have my car because that's all I've got. <laughs> and they proceeded to tell me what they thought of me. They had some thoughts. <laughs> Believe it or not, as we talked that night, their thoughts of me were linked to an understanding of the situation that was not exactly right. Now, apparently, their teenager, and I'd never experienced this before, and really I can say I have experienced it many times since, the teenager didn't quite tell their parents the exact story. Well, look at that. And they were really worked up, and if what their, their child had told them were true, I would have been worked up as well, except it wasn't. And here they were, not looking to think just thoughts, ultimately under the umbrella of truth in the first word in Philippians chapter 4, but they allowed their mind to think on things that weren't just, weren't right. Right now, you're cooped up inside, husband. Think on just things towards your wife, Mom, you're cooped up inside right now with your kids. Think on just things with your kids. Right. Young man, young lady, Christian, you walk around in this world and sometimes people are crazy right now. People are crazy. Think on just things. Allow your mind to be dominated by things that are right in nature toward other people. If old I wouldn't forget... You see here, represents perhaps a seed of bitterness toward a hurt or a perceived slight, a perceived slight. Maybe it represents a seed of irritation because lo and behold, my husband threw his socks on the ground. Everyone knows you can't live with someone who does that. And my wife... She messed up my tool bench. My child, they made a mess in the house. A fellow Christian who talked about ignored me in the hallway. Didn't respond to my Facebook friend request. I don't know what it may be. The devil in our minds have a way of, of building up uh, any number of wrong thoughts toward others. But Paul says, take God's word. And don't think on these things. You get to smash them. Can I smash it before we close tonight? Take the hammer of God's word and just. Yeah. That's by far the best one tonight. And Pastor Ryan, that's a mess. But I thankfully will give you an opportunity to think on just thoughts toward me while you clean that up. But Christian, how about you? Where's your mind at toward others right now? Is it all over the place? Is it in left field? How about in circumstances toward your God? Is it in left field? Like mine was when my car got hit because I don't deserve to be have my car hit if I came home from church, I wrongfully thought. Bible says, well, think on things that are just. Think on these things. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. Lord, help us. You know, our minds, Lord, our battlefield that I want to please you. Lord, and they are want to want to go all different directions. Lord, we need your help. Lord, help us. Those who are listening tonight, I wonder if tonight God touched your heart. If maybe your struggle wasn't with honorable or worthy things, but maybe it's in regards to others. Maybe there's a seed or a tree of bitterness, unforgiveness, anger. 
Would you give it to God tonight? Would you let His Word guide you, fill you with His truth, so you can think on these things? Maybe you need to bend a knee. You can do it at home. Maybe you're here in the auditorium and you need to come forward. If you're at home, you can get down on your knees and say, God, please forgive me. Help me. Maybe, my friend, maybe you're, you're tuned in tonight and you've never asked Jesus Christ to save you. I don't want you to leave and not understand that God loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for you. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And my friend, God loves you so much, just like he loves me. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for me and for you. He died on the cross to pay for our sins, for the wages of sin is death. See, the only way to pay for sin is to be separated from God. But the Bible says that God commended, he showed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The wages of sin is death, but Christ died. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You know that if you are a sinner, which the Bible says we all are, but if you turn to Jesus, he will save you from your sins, guaranteeing you a home in heaven with him forever. You can trust him tonight. You may have watched the service not knowing of your eternal destination, but before this night's out, you can trust in Jesus. You can ask Him. He'll forgive you from your sins. He'll promise to take you to heaven when you die. My friend, if you never trusted Christ, I'd encourage you to trust Him tonight. Sometimes we help someone pray a simple prayer. It's not in the words, but it's in the heart and belief. And if you believe that you're a sinner and that Jesus died for your sin, that He rose in the third day, you can trust him today. We lead in a prayer that goes something like this. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He was buried and rose on the third day. He would you save me? You take me to heaven when I die. I trust Jesus and him alone. You can pray that tonight and he'll hear you and save you. My friend, if you never trusted Christ, would you trust him? Now you can pray right where you're at. You can pray out louder in your heart. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Tell him. He'll hear you. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for and was buried and rose in the third day. Would you please save me and take me to heaven? I trust in Jesus and him alone. My friend, if you prayed that and you meant that, the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you prayed that and meant that, he saved you. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. If you prayed that and you meant that, my friend, I'd love to help you in your Christian walk. I'd love to send you a book that'll help you grow as a Christian. Would you contact us? Contact me. There's a number on your screen, an email address, and a website. If you go there, you can navigate quickly. Send us a message. You say, listen, I pray that I trust in Christ. Can I have that free book? I'd be happy to send you a copy. Help you grow as a Christian. It's the best news we know here at First Baptist Church that God loves you and Jesus died for you. If you trust him tonight, would you let us know? We'd love to help you and send you a book. Lord, thank you for what you're doing here. Thank you for all the, the folks who responded to you, Lord. Would you help our minds to be centered and fixed on you? Our minds would be stayed upon you. In Jesus' name.